When I was a child, I'd often find my mother scouring the pages of the Wall Street Journal. She was an avid stock investor and tended to limit herself to the tried and true stocks and mutual funds. She always made it clear to me that spending wisely and investing with as small a risk as possible were the way to ensure that our money would last. This became especially important after my father died and resources grew tight. You'd think that knowing about money at such a young age would have given me a leg up as an adult. But the lessons I learned from my mother were perhaps not the one she intended for me. What I got from her was that money was scarce, easy to lose, and hard to earn. I didn't get a good working knowledge of how money works. And as a result, I spent years putting money into questionable investments and the wrong kind of vehicles. And you know what? I believe I'm not alone in this. Even the most educated of us don't always know what's best and make preventable mistakes when it comes to money. I don't know about you, but I was never offered a course about money management in school. And had it come to a positive understanding about money the hard way, well into my adulthood. My guest, Deborah Ellis, knows all about the pitfalls of bad money management. As a certified financial planner, she dedicates herself to teaching women about money and how to devise plans that work best for them. Deborah is also the author of two books, Your Money and You, and her new book, Women and Wealth. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Deborah. Thank you very much, Debbie. It's so great to see you. It's so great to be here. And I loved your story because that is so indicative, so true for so many women. Though everyone's story is different, their history is different, but that the lessons we learn may or may not be the ones that our parents intended and that they are really hardwired into us. And if we don't address them and look at them and say, whoa, who are we financially? What is our financial persona? we really don't know what we're fighting against. And I loved what your mother said about, yes, it's very important to look at what you're investing in and know what you're investing in. But in this day and age, the market is so volatile and there's so much inflation that you need to take some risk or uh, the possibility of losing a lot of purchasing power because of inflation. And so how do you balance that so that you're comfortable, so that you can uh, work the way you wanna work and the what's best for you? And that I really do help a lot of people with. Yeah, we're gonna get into the, the details of the things we need to be aware of to do that. But I wanted to get back to just talking about attitudes about money. Um, as I said, uh, I was taught to believe that money is finite and that, the job was to conserve it. Uh, so tell me why it's not a beneficial way to look at money. Well, it, there's, a, there's a, a kernel in there that's good. Yes, you need to conserve it, but you don't wanna conserve it, you wanna grow it, you wanna nurture it. You want it to grow like you grow your children. You know, you feed them, you, you empower them, you let them grow. They're also a lot, it's not the only way of looking at it. Some people think money is evil. Some people think money is, uh, there's never enough money. It doesn't matter how much money you have. So it's not even conserving it. It's getting more and more and more and more. There, there are so many things that, that people, in your terms, so many people, so many things that people dream about with money. They want a lot of it. They want to do this. They want to do that. And really, it is more about your attitude, because it no matter how little money you have, if you feel wealthy, you are. And no matter how much money you have, if you feel poor, you are. And really being able to come to terms with your attitudes about money, what's important to you about money, what money means to you. Because, uh, you know, in an objective world, it's just a me. A, 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 it's a means of uh, transfer. It's, it's um, a spiritual transfer. You, pay, you can 
trade money for something you want or need. But in people's minds, people's attitudes, the way they were raised, there's so many different hurdles to get there before you just say, oh, it's just a transfer of assets. Yeah, I think uh, and we're referring to here, I believe it's called money scripts, the whole yes. idea, the attitude about the way we were raised, you know. And I think with in my mother's case, I always had the feeling that she probably thought that one day I'd have some Prince Charming rush into my life and, you know, take care of all of my needs. And so it wasn't that necessary for me to really have that nuts and bolts uh, education about money other than, you know, the, the sort of negative things she taught me about money. Uh, but that would be a money script, wouldn't it? That, yes, you know. and that's very it's interesting you brought that up because yes, we all have scripts, but so many um, women, so many people in general just think someone else is going to take care of their money for them and they don't have to worry about it. Uh, your husband, a lot of times your wife, they manage all the money, you don't have to worry. Um, but your financial advisor, your insurance person, you, you don't ask the questions you need to ask. You don't ask, um, how, where is my money now? What is it doing and where is it going? And that really does all come back to the scripts you were raised with, the scripts you buy into, the scripts you create for yourselves. And yet, because you you make a good point there, because even if you do have a you know, financial advisor or a broker, or some money manager who is handling your assets, you still need to know what's going on because you need to know if they're making mistakes or if they're putting you in things you're not comfortable with, right? Yeah, yeah, you absolutely need. There's questions you need to ask them. You need to ask them how they're getting paid. You need to know if they're selling, if you're putting your money into something that that's for your benefit or for their benefit. And a lot of times it's both. But that transparency, that understanding of how they're getting paid is really important. And be assured that if you have anyone advising you, they are getting paid. It's the transparency that's important for you to understand. How are they getting paid? So that you have a clear perspective that they're not putting you into funds because they're making huge uh, commissions, whether or not you ever make any money. Uh, there are so many different ways to invest our money. Uh, but we get back into you know the, these money scripts. Uh, when you have somebody who has always used money to find happiness, for example, how do you steer them into investments that, that make the right sense for them? I, I have them look at what is it that actually makes them happy. And generally it's not the money. And if they can see that, then they can deal more honestly with what is it that's making them happy? Um, is it listening to good music or is it actually the expensive stereo system? And if they won't like listening to good music, do they want the time to listen to good music? And in order to have the time, where is the income coming from and how are they gonna develop a lifestyle and a long-term plan so that they always have enough money that they have enough time to sit and listen to music? You help people create financial and investment plans uh, for their lives. So um, you said when somebody comes to you, you start off asking them questions about what they want, but how do you know where to lead them into what they should do? Um, I usually start by asking them, I usually send them a questionnaire before I even talk to them and ask them, uh, what is their experience with financial advisors? What is their experience with money? Why do they call me? What do they want? What do they need? What are the real reasons? And I'll give them a few options, but you know, spaces for them to fill it in. And I also ask them, why is this important right now? And usually there's a reason why at that moment they walked into my office, they wanted to talk to me. And we look at that question, why is it important right now? What's going on right now that this has become top of mind? And we explore that and we look at 
why this is important right now, but where they're trying to go and what they want to do. What is, and then we look at their money scripts, what's been stopping them from getting there, uh, what do they think would help them get there, what, uh, what are the obstacles in their way, what are their goals, and then we look at, then if we proceed to a plan, they have to give me all of their financial data. And we look at where's the money going now? Where's the money coming from now? Where can we make adjustments? Where can we make changes? And even with all of that, they have, it's their input. They absolutely have to be on board. If they're not on board, it, it doesn't matter what I tell them. So we'll look at different scenarios. If they say, oh, this doesn't look like it'll work at all. I ask them what would work. How can we get there? What do you want to do? And there, it's usually so much more involved than just the money. It's, it's not just, do I invest in X, Y, Z? I can't say stock names on the air because <laughs> then it's a recommendation. Uh, it, uh, I can't just say buy X, Y, Z. I can't just say do this or that, but we can look at asset allocation. If you're a high, if you can tolerate volatility, you can buy more high volatile uh, assets. If you can't, if you need fixed income, that sets up a different scenario. If you're certain ages, ages doesn't matter as much as it did. Now we have people with, uh, you know, I have clients who have tremendous assets at 70, 80 years old. And it's no, they don't have to be real conservative because they have more than enough to support them. They're looking at how can it grow over the next 20, 30 years to pass on to different generations. So for that part of the money, it can be, it doesn't have to be so conservative. It can be a more aggressive because if it goes up and down, um, if it's volatile over the long run, best case scenario, it's not gonna matter. Uh, can you explain the concept of compounding interest? Oh, my favorite. The eighth wonder of the world. Albert Einstein considered it the way eighth wonder of the world. Okay. If you have $100 in a savings account and it's making 5% simple interest, um, the first year you'll get your $5. 5% annually. The second year you'll get your $5. The third year you'll get your $5. Okay, 20 years later, you'll have $200. If you put it in 5% in compound, it's getting compound interest annually. The first year you get your $5, but the second year you get interest on the $105. The third year you'll have, I think by the third year you have about $110, $112. So you get interest on that. And the, the simple way of explaining it is if you took a doll, a penny, um, would you rather have a penny today or would you rather have a million dollars today or a penny today that's doubled every day for 30 days? That's compound interest. In 30 days, you have over $5 million. So do you want your million dollars today or do you wanna wait 30 days and get your five million? So the magic of compounding interest and the magic of the time value of money is profound. Einstein really did call it the eighth wonder of the world. That really is one of his quotes. So, uh, and then having money in like a tax deferred account. If you have it in a regular account, you make your $5, that, that $5 is taxable income, okay? If you have it on, in a tax deferred account, it's not taxable income until you take it out. So you make your $5 the first year, you owe a dollar or two in taxes, you have $4. So even in a compound interest, the next year you're gonna get your interest on $104, not 105. So going forward, having it in a tax deferred account is huge. How can people find out more about you and your services? Oh, thank you very much. You can contact me. You can absolutely go to my website, DebraWEllis.com. I don't know if you're able to put anything across banners or anything like that, but um, it's D-E-B-O-R-A-H-W-E-L-L-I-S.com. 
you can email me at dellis at cogentadvisors.com. That's dellis at cov, oh, sorry, c-o-g-e-n-t-a-d-v-i-s-o-r-s.com, cogentadvisors.com, or Google Deborah W. Ellis. Got to have the W in there because there's a lot of Debbies, of, a lot of us Debbies out there. <laughs>